Good afternoon. Um, Guangzhou, November 13th, 2002. The artist Huang Yongping and a crew of local, local welders are putting the finishing touches on a one-to-one -one replica of a section of an airplane. The cockpit and its left wing form a boomerang shape as the plane's sheet metal cries out for its first coat of paint. A polyethylene tarp of the sort found on construction sites throughout the Pearl River Delta, striped red, white, and blue, hangs over the raw end of the fuselage. It sits on something resembling a public plaza, which itself sits on a fastidiously manicured island in the Pearl River, in front of a boxy, green-tiled museum building from which hangs a banner entreating the public to welcome, with outstanding contributions, the successful opening of the 16th Party Congress. Behind it, another tarp covers a scaffold, inside of which Ai Weiwei has hung his first chandelier. Above that, on a facet of the museum's facade, the artist Gu Dexin has installed cheap plastic Corinthian order pilasters in white and gold, framing a single sans serif sentence, reading simply in red, in God we trust. The coats of paint still to come would have transformed Huang's oversized object, giving it signifying potential as an American plane, and specifically the Navy EP-3 signals intelligence plane that, after colliding with a Chinese fighter jet, presumably killing its pilot, landed on Hainan Island on April 1st, 2001, where its crew of 24 was held for 10 days until the US government issued a document known as the Letter of the Two Sorries, not an apology, but a statement of regret that A, the pilot had died, and B, the plane had been in Chinese airspace without verbal clearance. Ultimately, like the real plane, Huang's replica was dismantled and carted away. A visit from a tall American consular official, his shirt bloused over his trousers in the foggy bottom style of the early aughts, appeared that moment to see what was going on, potentially after having been tipped off by his French counterpart, who, on the grounds that Huang was a French citizen, had pulled the first piece of Huang's replica, the tail and its fin, from an exhibition supported by the French government in nearby Shenzhen just over a year earlier in what was the immediate aftermath of September 11th. News of the American official's visit must have made its way up the chain to the point where Guangdong Museum of Art director Wang Huangsheng received a call from the Foreign Affairs Office of Guangdong Province, of which his museum was a part, advising him to remove the piece from the first Guangzhou Triennial, slated to open the following week. Wang, who had risked his career in organizing the exhibition, curated by Wu Hong with Huang Zhuan and Feng Boyi on the theme of Reinterpretation, a Decade of Experimental Art in China, 1990 to 2000, could only oblige. And so visitors to the exhibition were soon confronted not with a plane, but with a giant void. The artists organized in resistance. I, a recent university graduate on assignment as the Triennial's in-house translator, helped to prepare the letter they signed and circulated. Uh, Huang, for his part, would go on to create multiple works incorporating this story and giving it new life. August 2013. I'm two years into my work at the helm of the Ulin Center for Contemporary Art in Beijing, an institution founded in 2007 at a moment of openness that anticipated the Olympics and that would ultimately prove short-lived. We are working with the American artist Taryn Simon to show her landmark series, A Living Man Declared Dead and Other Chapters 1 to 18, which methodically traced the bloodlines and mapped the kinship networks around particularly fraught stories of cultural and political overdetermination. Her rigorous methodology calls for each chapter to, presented, to be presented through three kinds of panels, one containing carefully arrayed portraits, another containing visual annotations to the story, and a third containing only text. The Ministry of Culture, which has decided for these purposes to consider each of the thousands of individual images as a discrete artwork, needed to issue a stamped authorization in order to import this work into China. 
We received word that certain images do not pass muster. The image of a dead body, for example, with leprosy in the titular chapter, floating in the Ganges near Varanasi. A whole chapter about a South Korean seaman abducted by the North in 1977. The annotations from the China chapter, for which Simon had asked the State Council Information Office to source for her a family capable of representing the entire nation, a panel which included such subversive imagery as the official paper bag in which State Council press materials are circulated to journalists. As individual images could not be removed or obscured from panels, their censorship effectively meant that of the entire panel. A further decision was taken not to import the text panels, which when reviewed as art and translated would have made many additional images subject to legibility and thus to censorship, and which being in English were not immediately legible to the majority of museum visitors anyway, which distributed instead a free brochure with full translation of all text. Simon decided to represent these absences which echoed absent portraits of dead or uncooperative sitters that run throughout her bloodlines with simple black boxes painted onto the gallery walls. For Simon, this in fact became a new piece that has been shown and even collected by institutions in the intervening years. Absence as presence, removal as performance, lacuna as testament. New York. September 2017, bringing us to the recent events surrounding an exhibition that I have been deeply involved with as co-curator for the past few years, the Guggenheim's Art and China After 1989 Theater of the World. Time is short and information is in ample supply, so I will not recount the story of the controversy around the three included works which both A, happen to present or record live animals, and B, happen to have been described in the report by New York Times Beijing Bureau Chief Jane Perlez circulated on September 20th. For me, the most troubling assumption in the long and difficult conversation around these works and their eventual suspension from display is the one that the presentation of a work of art in a museum is tantamount to ethical endorsement of its content and of the artist's actions in making it. For me, this implies a populist paternalism far more deleterious than any I've encountered in the past 10 years of working under an authoritarian state. The steps that were taken were somehow enough to diffuse the explosive threats of violence from an insta mob of nearly a million, and in the process to win back some of the space in the conversation for the larger themes we had spent the past several years trying to foreground. The particular strategies used by Sun Yuan, Peng Yu, Xu Bing to mark their work's absence, paused videos, empty screens, statements, recalled for me my experience of working with Taryn Simon a few years earlier. In Huang Yongping's case, as is somehow nearly always the case for an artist whose seminal, one of whose seminal works in the 1980s was a plan to pull over the National Art Gallery using a series of ropes tied to its facade, the work grew to encompass the world around it. And yet the accusations of censorship and calls to uphold freedom of expression repeated again yesterday in a New York Times editorial, fail to account for what I think is perhaps the most powerful valence of art in our current social moment. Its ability to point out where the limits of any particular discursive system lie. Having spent my career to date working on a tightrope between two great powers, I have come to believe in art not simply as a vehicle of expression in the classic liberal sense, but particularly now, now that the teleological certainty of China's political liberalization in the wake of economic development has collapsed, exacerbated this past year by recent and continued existential affronts to our own American democracy to show what at any given moment in any single place cannot be shown. Thank you. <laughs>